let's get started. So quick self intro. Hello, everybody. My name is Wei Ting Liu. I'm the founder and CEO of Arc. We are a remote hiring platform helping startups hire amazing remote engineers. We're also a Techstars company as we went through Techstars Seattle program as co-mentor way back in 2013. And our guest today is Mel Gavette, CEO of Techstars. Mel is an author, entrepreneur, and leading technology executive for over 15 years. She's the author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Trampled by Unicorns, Big Tech's Empathy Problems and How to Fix It, and is now currently the CEO and board member of Techstars, a global network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. And Mel, welcome to our event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Wednesday, everyone. So Mel, I'd love to learn more entrepreneur journey and how you end up on the other side as the CEO of Techstars. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do it very, very briefly. Um, so I, I started my first business when I was 16. I come, I come from, I'm French. Uh, I live in New York to answer your question previously. Um, and I come from a family that didn't really have a lot of, uh, a lot of money growing up. And so the first business I built when I was 16 was honestly just because I wanted to be able to buy things that my parents just could not afford. Um, and then that became a second business and then a third business. So I'm a, I'm a three time entrepreneur. And then after that, I spent six years at the Boston consulting group, uh, frankly, mostly because I didn't want to get, uh, to go back to school and get an MBA. And I was like, BCG would be the, the plan B. Uh, it would be like an MBA, but I will be paid and I'll have real, real world experience. And it was supposed to be only two years. And, and as I mentioned, it ended up being six. And then after that, I was actually in the process of, of uh, building my fourth company. Um, and I had a, an aha moment where I realized that I could actually join companies um, that were very entrepreneurial and fast growing and, and with, with a great pace of innovation. Uh, without having to go through the zero to one because I had discovered tech and I had discovered the internet and I'm dating myself a little bit, but, um, and so rather than go and build, <clears throat> build my first company, I, uh, joined a, a small startup, which became a, one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world. And then I joined, uh, then I joined the Priceline group, uh, which I think people are generally familiar with because. Uh, they own Booking.com and OpenTable and Kayak and Agoda, uh, and so I joined them as uh, to to oversee all the operations. Then I moved to uh, a CEO role for Compass, which is the largest residential uh, real estate company in the United States, with a very strong, uh, very strong technology platform. And then I came to TechStars, and and to close that 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 story, uh, to me, the, the, the texter's role was like one of these unbelievable moments uh, where you realize that everything you've done in your life has prepared you to the things you're about to do. And, and when, when I was approached by the headhunter for Techstars, it, it, as he was describing the role and as I did my due diligence and, and started talking to people, I was like, oh my God, this is this is the job that I never knew existed, but I really wanted to uh, to see exist because it's about working with entrepreneur and helping them. It's about scaling the company. So it's not a few dozen entrepreneur, it's thousands of entrepreneurs who can benefit from what Techstars is doing. It is international, it is disruptive because I think a lot of investors in the tech world have been operating in the same way for, a few decades and, and disruption would be very much welcome in that area. Uh, and so that's the best job I've ever had. Let's just do that. And so that's, that's how I ended up at Techstars. Yeah. Techstars yeah. right now is this amazing global network of thousands of startups and I guess tens of thousands of people within the community. And given the volatile time as is right now, I'm sure there's a lot of people who could, who could, who, who look up to Techstars for some guidance. So um, the topic of the event is about how startups can um, can 
can proceed at a volatile time such as this one. So the 2022 crisis is the third major tech downturn of the internet era following mm -hmm. the dot-com bubble and the Great Recession. And it's actually been approximately about 14 years since the last major correction. And honestly, a few in our industry have actually gone through a full economic cycle. So as an example, the last recession was in 2008. And when we, when I started our company in 2013, 2014, the entire industry was booming. So for many of us, along with other startups founded in the last 10 plus years, uh, many, most of us have never really operated during a downturn before, right? So Mel, does the environment in which one starts a company impact how one sees the world and operates the business? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot about entrepreneurship as a sport um, and you develop a certain type of muscles. And I'm sure you all know uh, if you are a boxer or if you are a dancer, uh, you will be equally fit, but you will have developed very different muscles. And the same, the same is true uh, for founders, depending on whether they, they build a company during boom time or downtime, uh, you will have developed different muscles and different habits. Um, and so if you are, if you started in an environment where valuation will go up and up and up and up every time uh, you were increasing your top line and no one really cared about your bottom line and the way you would attract employees would be through massive uh, stock option packages and you would fight for engineers because they are the rare resource uh, and their, their, their compensation package would be higher than pretty much anyone else in the company versus if you started uh, your startup in an environment where money is hard to get by, the only conversation you have with your, with your investors and with your board is about uh, how you're going to survive the next 12 to 18 months, uh, you don't hire anybody that you don't strictly need because you can't afford it because you don't know whether or not you're gonna get, when you're gonna get the next fundraise. Like these are two very different type of experience and two very different type of muscles. It does not mean that one can't learn how to develop other muscles, but like it needs to be a conscious, it needs to be a very conscious effort. Uh, and and a, a lot of, self-awareness about what are the mechanism that I developed as, as a founder, as an entrepreneur. Uh, and if they are not, if they're clearly not adapted to the new environment I'm facing, what are the mechanism that I need to put in place? What are the new muscles that I need to exercise and grow to, um, to be able to operate in the new environment? Because when you're a founder, when you're an entrepreneur to a large extent, uh, muscle memory plays a huge, huge role. Like you can't make it up every minute of the day. And so you have to rely on your experience and your habit. And so you have to train yourself to be able to do that uh, in a different environment. Yeah. yeah. And given the macro has changed dramatically in the past few months, what are some of the biggest mindset shifts or muscles that founders who started their companies in the last five years need to um, train or make adjustment for to survive this economic downturn? Um, so the, 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 the one that you probably heard about a million times and, and, and you're probably sick and tired of it is uh, developing a muscle around managing runway rather than optimizing for growth. I think historically founders were incentivized to really be gross focus, like more revenue, more revenue, more top line, show me that you can expand, show me that you can gain customers. Uh, and, and when you are facing a economic uncertainty, in particular from a fundraising perspective, obviously managing your runway becomes a top priority. And it's, it's hard, it's hard to switch from one to another. So even if you heard it for a, a million times, um, being very conscious about the fact that every decision you make needs to be done now through the lens of managing your runway rather than, than optimizing for growth is actually a pretty, uh, pretty good mental, uh, pretty good mental exercise. Um, 
but again, you've heard that one many, many times. I think what I find more interesting um, is things around um, the people you surround yourself with and how do you manage employees. And what I mean by that is in a, in a, in a bull market, uh, when finding capital is decently easy, don't don't get me wrong. Fundraising is always complicated. It's always painful. No one really loves fundraising, but in a market where there is tons of money and and venture capital is is uh, suffering from deep FOMO, fear of missing out, and and like uh, if that doesn't work with one, that's okay. You'll work with the next one. Uh, there is a very natural tendency to uh, for founders to not uh, to not feel like they need mentors and coaches around them because th th it seems to be always positive. Like things are always evolving uh, towards the best. Um, so you tend to to rely less on your network and 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 more on on just the the work that you're doing. And you're like, as long as I work hard and my top line grows, that's fine. I'm going to be able to fundraise, uh, and money will solve a lot of problem uh, within the company. When you're in an economic uncertainty, um, you're gonna need um, you're gonna need a lot more support from a lot more people to figure out how to manage your business, to get access to to people who may potentially uh, sign you checks, uh, and so it's just suddenly leveraging your network and making sure that uh, you have in your network people that are true mentors and who are going to help you. Um, open door and solving problem is actually really, really important and, and more important than in positive market. And then the other point I would make, and really we could talk about this for hours, but the, the other point I would make is um, in an economic boom, um, what you are going to be focused on most likely is how to raise money. Uh, and as a result of that, how to hire as many people as possible. So you'll have a lot of conversations around how can you build a recruiting machine? How can you make sure that your compensation packages are aligned with what the market wants and you need to review them often, in particular with engineers, because the numbers keep going up and up and up and up. Um, and so you develop that habit and you you, you develop this. If, and if you do a good job, you develop this muscle, going back to my analogy before, uh, that is 100% focus on hiring um, and optimizing hiring. When you're going through an economic downturn or economic uncertainty, uh, these things change. It doesn't mean that you're not going to hire. By the way, like there's a lot of people who continue to that can, will continue to hire. A lot of companies that continue to hire, but suddenly uh, every hire counts. Like you want to make sure that you get every hire right. While before it was a lot, a little more about quantity because like you needed to grow your business. Suddenly, uh, likely your valuation is not moving, or potentially you have to go to a down round through a down round. Um, so suddenly it becomes a lot harder to explain your compensation package to candidates. Uh, in particular from a stock option perspective. And, but at the same time, because it's economic uncertainty, you don't necessarily have the cash to offer much bigger base comp. And so like really rethinking the way uh, you're attracting candidates uh, become, become really, really important because the salary is, is definitely not gonna be, uh, not gonna be your, strongest, your strongest call at that time. Um, thinking about how do you mentor and develop employees who are already in your company because you don't want them to leave uh, becomes even more important. Making sure that you prioritize well because what's likely going to happen is you have this optimizing growth mentality and so uh, you keep adding uh, task and priority because you want to grow, 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 but you can't you don't have as many employees or you're not growing your employee base as much. And so suddenly you're like, oh, the number of tasks is, keep growing, but my team is not growing. It's potentially decreasing or it stays flat. And so suddenly like being really, really strict on prioritization becomes really, really important. And so all of that, there, there's not really a recipe for, for, for or one size fits all. 
but these are very, very different muscle and, and very, very different things that you need to start doing that you probably were not doing really when everything was going well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So speaking of managing runway, um, I think the standard recommendation that we've been reading online these days is VCs, investors typically recommend founders to have at least two years, if not three years of runway. Um, understand that nobody can time the market and it seems like every week there's some kind of bad news. However, I wonder if there's, if you can share, if there's any latest prediction um, that industry experts are offering right now, um, when do you think the market um, may bottom and how long do you think the downturn will last this time? Uh, look, this is, this is a wild guess and I'd probably be in a very different job if I had the exact answer, but I can, I can give you a few elements of answers. The first one is there is still a lot of markets in, in the venture world that really needs to be deployed. Uh, the venture capital industry raised a lot of money in 2021 all the way to the end of Q1 2022. And so there are this massive, massive amount of money that are uh, waiting to be deployed. Um, and so while it was very clear over the summer that everybody was very much into a wait and see mode, uh, it is not the case. Uh, it's not going to be the case forever because again, there is a there's a, a time frame um, within which the the a fund needs to be deployed. So I, I want I want every entry every time I talk to an entrepreneur, I start with that because it's not a situation where there is no money. It's a situation where people with money are just wondering whether or not now is the right time to deploy that money. And time plays in their favor for now, but at some point it's going to reverse because at some point their LPs are going to ask them why they're not deploying. Uh, and if they don't deploy there, then most of the time their LPs are going to take the capital back uh, and they're not going to get management fees, et cetera. So right now we're still again in the phase where they are they have the upper hand, but that's not going to last forever. So the, that's the first thing. The second thing um, is... Um, a crisis, the second thing is companies still get funded. Uh, even through a crisis, uh, we have 3,100 portfolio in, company, in our portfolio, 3,100 companies in our portfolio. Every single week, uh, you can see on, on Texter's web, website uh, and on our social media uh, channels, every single week, if not every single day, we announce one of our portfolio company that has fundraised. Um, and so I think today alone, we've, we've announced two already. Uh, and so again, fundraising is possible and no matter what the economic downturn is, uh, you can still fundraise. It will be longer. It will be harder. It will be more focused on, on profitability, but it will, it is still possible. Now to answer very specifically your question, I heard everything from 18 months to 36 months. Uh, I, I will discount completely people who, who say that it's going to be only until end of year. Like that, that can't be, um, for multiple reasons that we don't have to, we don't have time to, to go into, but from, from inflation to the labor market, to supply chain challenges, to like all of that makes it impossible for that crisis to be done by the end of the year. But I also don't think. I also don't think that it's going to be uh, this, the same situation for the next 10 years. So if I had to bet, probably 18 to, yeah, 18 to 36 months uh, with a lot of uncertainty right now, that makes it impossible to be more precise. Yeah, no, thank you. So, so let's talk, so let's switch gear a little bit and let's talk about hiring. Um, so after a banner tech, a banner year in for tech, recession is here and in 2022 alone, more than 76,000 employees have been laid off according to layoff tracker, layoffs.fyi. At the same time, competition for talent still remains fierce and there is a huge number of open roles right now. So with all those in mind, um, how would you suggest uh, Techstars portfolio companies 
on their hiring plans right now. Um, what kind of company should consider hiring aggressively um, or try to conserve cash and how to adjust the hiring plans in this uncertain market? Yeah, so same thing. There's really, in this particular question, there's really not one size fits all because you have company uh, you have companies who that, that have been hiring like crazy for the last two years because they were flush with cash and they just needed to support their growth and their growth meant hiring, hiring, hiring. And a lot of the layoffs that you see now have, based on, on my understanding of, of the market, have more to do with companies that have overhired and probably be a little more open to risk and to to um, to opening roles that were important but not critical uh, basically now just recalibrating and be like oh okay well, yeah we probably can can do with 10 percent less people or 20 percent less people based on my observation again it's not statistically relevant but based on my observation a lot of layoffs fall into that category. Um, the, I think we're entering now, now that Labor Day, in particular in the US, Labor Day is behind us, everybody's back to work. Uh, and I'm not just talking about startup, I'm talking the finance world, the VC world, everybody basically is back to work. Um, I think now we're gonna see whether or not other companies are going into layoff, which are not related to, oh, we overhired, let's recalibrate and more about hey like the situation is not getting better we now really need to go into cost cutting uh so again what you've seen in the past is not necessarily a good a, a, a good uh way to predict what's going to happen in the future so what needs to do what you need to do for your company very much depends on where you are uh you need to be very calm very deliberate uh, but also uh, very, very urgent in the way you make your decisions. So you need to start with having a proper cash flow forecast, like objectively, based on everything you know about your business, what is the best case scenario? What is the worst case scenario? What is what you believe to be the realistic scenario from a cash perspective? Um, and if, uh, if when you look at your best case scenario, um, you are already below... 18 months run rate, you probably need to start restructuring your business very, very, very aggressively. If you look at that and in your mo in your uh, aggressive scenario, optimistic scenario, you're at like 36, 40 months, then maybe, but when you look at the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario doesn't look great. Maybe you need to, on the margin, look at, hey, do we need to have this project like maybe we don't need that project it's not as core for the business like maybe we we unfortunately have to let go that team so that even in the worst case scenario we're still we're still going to be decently comfortable in the next 18 24 30 months so it's just it really depends it also will evolve uh and what i mean by that is the answer today mid-september uh is the answer for today mid-september you're going to have to look at that on a very regular basis. Um, and it's probably at least once a month where you, when, when you close your book, you look at your cash flow situation, you look at what are your revenue, you, you look at if you're fundraising, like what's going on, and then you take the next, the next sets, uh, the next set of measure um, to get your, you, to continue, keep your business uh, going. So very much depends, but I would, I would strongly recommend to, have a proper cash flow, have scenarios, uh, be very proactive in making decisions, like not just hope that somehow the universe is going to save you, uh, and then be very deliberate in this action, take them very rapidly, but not hesitate to take a small one, see what happened, take the next small one, see what happened, um, so that you, you are as flexible as the market currently is. And... And how about for the companies that are actually in a very fortunate situation to have just successfully raised funding? Do you think they should probably, given the right runway in mind, 
uh, consider hiring more aggressively to attract all the talent out there uh, because they're actually the one who seem to be in a very good situation with abundance of funding in their work. I mean, I mean uh, if you can, let's never, let's not get a good crisis, let's not have a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and so if you can, if you have the means to hire, yeah, absolutely, you should. I think the, the question for you is look at your cash flow and what do you mean when you say that you have, uh, you've just fundraised and you have enough money to hire? Because if you operate with the same mindset as the one that we've seen for the last 10 years, what you mean by I've just fundraised and I have enough runway is, oh, I can wait another 12 to 18 months to fundraise, which was absolutely fine in the previous time may not be that fine in in two days time uh, because you may not be able to raise 12 to 18 months from now and so i would i would always like ask myself what does that mean i'm in a good place and I, i've just raised this is this is great i would go back to my cash flow and be like okay with the current burn rate how long am i capable of um of driving my company through the crisis and if the answer is i need to fundraise in 18 months the fact that you've just fundraised doesn't change anything you still need to figure out how to decrease your burn rate quite dramatically if you are in a very fortunate situation where um you raised enough money that fundraising doesn't necessarily need to be an option for you or it's it is at a distant enough future that there's really no risk that you're going to find yourself having to down to to dramatically change your strategy then by all means now would be a perfect time to go and hire some really amazing people uh, who are going to find themselves on the market because of the layoff that I, I mentioned i mentioned earlier got it and well given that arc is a remote hiring platform connecting silicon valley caliber remote engineers with startups i'd like to ask about your thoughts on remote um so for early stage startups being founded um these days would you say that remote work is still a competitive edge in a post-pandemic world or do you think establish a hybrid remote plus office routine may be more beneficial for very, very early startups. So you're asking two very different questions in one question. So is this an advantage to hire people to offer a remote environment? Yeah, totally. Though I'm starting to see people who are actually employees who are actually looking to go back to an office, uh, which is a new phenomenon for about, I would say six months. Like we're, we're, we're really starting to see people saying, I love I loved working remote, but like I also miss the interaction, like the 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 in person interaction, and I'm I want to go back to an office, and 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 I think we don't speak enough about that, especially in social media is very much about about remote work and how amazing that is, and and I can tell you firsthand that I have met an increasing amount of people who are actually really really tired of remote. And, and actually want to go back to an office for, for different reasons, personality, but also sometimes, you know, they don't have the setting in their home that makes it that great for them to work from home. So this is a small detail, but I, I, feel, I feel the social media is incredibly biased towards, towards one conversation and it, it doesn't have enough of the other one. Now, to answer your two questions, um, is it a hiring advantage? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, understandably enough, the vast, vast, vast majority of human being like the flexibility that remote works provide. Uh, and the idea that they don't have to go to the office every day from nine to five or whatever the, the, the time, the, the schedule of the company they work for is. Um, so yes, is this the right thing to do for, for a startup? That's questionable. Uh, they are, it will depend on how comfortable the CEO is with that. Uh, and I mean, comfortable, not, not mentally or morally comfortable with it. I mean, more like what type of manager is that person? Because managing a, a remote first uh, team is significantly more complicated than managing uh, a team that is in an office, in a space, and you can actually go to people and talk to them. And I'm not talking about 
a control type of management. I'm talking about how do you build working relationship with people in your team? And there are people who are very comfortable doing that over Slack and over Zoom and over emails. And there are people who are more, I would call them in-person social animals and for, for whom like being in person actually really matters to build relationship. And so if we're talking about a founder, a small startup, I think the first question I always ask them is, what is your management style? Like, how do you manage people? Like, how are you comfortable communicating to people your your ideas and, and, and interacting uh, and debating them? Uh, and depending on that, you may want to, to think through what is the, the right model uh, that, that you want to implement in your company. Um, and then the second thing I, I often tell founders is independently of the model that you choose, whether it's remote, fully in person, hybrid two days a week, hybrid, aka remote, but then you have events on a regular basis, whatever the format is, um, you need to be very, very intentional about the values that you you uh, hold dear and the way you communicate everything throughout the company. Um, and I think there's been, um, especially with remote work, it's very easy um, to forget that a lot of the communication historically used to happen by the coffee machine. And a lot of the information in a company would happen as people would bump into each other by the coffee machine or in the elevator. And that doesn't happen anymore. And so if you go into, um, or it doesn't happen to the same extent, if you go into a hybrid model or fully remote model, um, you need to be very, very intentional about how you want to communicate any type of information and what are the values that you hold uh, that are very important to you because you are, you're not going to be able as easily, um, you're not going to be able as easily to, to uh, get them people to feel them like Zoom and emails and Slack are not, are not going to be the same way. And so you're going to have to be much more purposeful in the way you want to implement values, which means that you also need to be very clear on what they are and what it means in terms of behavior expected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, qualitative, <laughs> yeah, yes. And curious, qualitatively or quantitatively, do you see, how do you see Techstars portfolio companies see remote work? Do you see more early stage Techstars portfolio companies being founded who embrace remote work more? And how about the later stages? Any observations? Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know more compares to what, more compares to before COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Zoom is here to stay and, and, and there's a lot more flexibility in the way people live their life. Um, but compared to what it was even a year ago, uh, no, actually, I see uh, I see more companies compared to a year, year and a half ago, uh, who, on the contrary, insist on on having co-founders who are co-located and like teams who spend real time in person together, um, because they are missing that. They're they're just missing the we we are social animals, like we most of us at least, um, and so. The, I think there's come a realization for a lot of entrepreneurs that actually being alone in front of, in front of their laptop is not the life that they want to have. And so they start looking for co-founders or team members with whom they're going to be able to spend time in person. So again, a lot more remote than it was two, three years ago before the pandemic. Uh, but I can definitely see trends. I have no idea where it's going to land. Like, I, I, I don't know if we're going to go back to the majority of companies uh, being in person, probably not, but I don't know. I don't know either if we're going to, if we're going to continue to have that many remote first companies, because I'm, I'm, I'm sensing from entrepreneurs and, and, and their teams, the need to be in person a lot more uh, these days. Yeah. Yeah. And, Let's switch gear a little bit to focus now on the talent mm -hmm. perspective. So um, for engineers or anyone looking to join new tech startups, 
what do you think is the right approach to identify high potential teams and the next up and coming companies um, at, at a volatile time such as this one? Um, it depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking for early stage, mid stage, late stage? Uh, how much of a risk uh, are you ready to take versus not? So um, I think, and, and also what is, what is your financial situation and how much compensation matters versus, um, versus the type of work that you're doing. And it's not that one is uh, completely opposed to the other. Hopefully you can find a job that, that allows you to have both. Uh, the reality is most of the time for most of us, there is some trade-offs and some compromise. And, and I encourage the, the, the entrepreneurs that I mentor, uh, I encourage them a lot to think about what their priorities in life are. And if it's money, that's totally fine. Like if, if, if I had a, I had a mentee like that coming to me and say, you know, like I'm the, I'm the only breadwinner in my family. My parents rely on me, my spouse and my three children rely on me money matters to me like i need to be able to to bring home a good paycheck uh and because of that like i'm okay to have a job that is not as exciting as if i was you know doing and we were talking about something else like if i was doing that that would uh, that probably would be amazing but like i don't have the same stability and i need that stability to take care of my family so um i i really always try to explain that Every situation is different. Every person has different circumstances and, and we should be very, very aware of never judging why a person makes a decision about one job versus the other, because this is very likely depending on uh, personal circumstances that we unlikely know completely. So you need to first start with that, which is like, what are you optimizing for? Uh, what is your dream job? And then based on, based on that, um, how do you go after the right companies? I mean, you, I'm sure you, you, I mean, I hope I would recommend that you connect with a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, texters organize startup weekend and startup event all around the world. These are usually a good opportunity to look at that. We have a website. I think last time I looked at it, we had like 10,000 job opening. Uh, so you can always look there. There's, there's a lot of jobs for, um, for engineers. Um, and then you go and, and look at the company, look at the stage, look at what they're doing, uh, meet the people. And then again, based on the criteria that you've decided for yourself or what you're optimizing for, um, I, I am sure you will find something that works for you because just to be clear, engineers are still very much in demand. Uh, no matter how many layoffs there has been that we've discussed uh, a little earlier during this conversation, uh, there's still more jobs than there is engineers. And so I would recommend to spend time with the team and, and talk to people who left the company uh, to understand why they left and, and, and was, it, uh, was it related to something in the culture of the company that they didn't like or was it just because you know, they wanted to try something else that should I always find interesting that a lot of candidates don't spend a lot of time actually doing their due diligence on the company's culture and don't spend more time talking to former uh, to former employees and, 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 and existing employees. So that I would do a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, a quick reminder for the audience. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Mel here, feel free to punch them into the chat box and we'll We'll, we'll get down to those um, at the end of our conversation. So feel free to share any questions that you have. Um, so Mel, um, as the market continues to, I guess, swing wildly, are there any industries that you feel more confident or that you think have great high growth potential in the next three, five, or 10 years? Or any trend that you can predict um, that you'll predict that will take off? Or, yeah, maybe the yeah, I mean, um, again, if we're talking about what are the industries that are most likely in the next 5, 10, 15 years going to see a lot of innovation and a lot of unicorns, yeah, I can totally talk about it. It does not mean that on the way there, 
they're not gonna there's not gonna be huge swing of valuation and and companies dying and company being companies being uh created so the swings that you were talking about don't necessarily have anything to do with the fact that there are industries that are uh that are going in my opinion to be big 10 years from now so the, i think the the perfect example is everything related to blockchain uh i think that the there's probably no market that is uh, again to use your word swinging more widely than crypto right now which is one of the application of blockchain uh it doesn't change the fact that I, i'm still very bullish on the blockchain technology and on its application uh, across different type of uh type of um startups um i think there is uh, a lot right now to be said around um all all companies focus on sustainability environment uh there will still be swing especially because right now there's a massive backlash around esg so um uh, environmental soci societal and governance related uh companies um so lots of backlash around it um but at the same time uh you know we still have to solve the 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 climate change issues that we are facing we still have to solve the destruction of our environment uh and what it means for the future generation so is there is there going to be uh billion dollar companies created in that in that vertical absolutely is that going to be a walk in the park uh yeah, absolutely not and so uh there's going to be a lot of things related to that lots of innovation right now happening in um agrotech um i think the war in ukraine has to a large extent um made quite a few people realize that uh, feeding the world um was not a problem that we had solved entirely so there's a lot lot happening in that in that area um health tech um lots of progress um developing world and developed world as well so uh health tech will continue to be in my opinion a great source of innovation in the future uh and then i talked about blockchain one of the primary application of blockchain is fintech um and not just not just cryptocurrency but just in general fintech and the, the the way the way money moves around um and so i do expect that fintech is going to continue to be a pretty uh pretty interesting industry from from an upside perspective uh if you're an investor uh or from a job perspective if you're an engineer and thank you and people typically say that there are many great startups will be founded during a recession such as this one but how about from the talent's perspective is there any skill set hard hard skills or soft skills that people in tech should try to learn to prepare them better for the future or how can talent our candidates um take advantage of the downturn to build a brighter, a brighter future for them in mm. tech. Uh so if I had a dollar every time I heard people say great startups are founded during recession I'd be very rich by now. Uh <laughs> I kind of get this period which is oh you know don't be sad it's okay great startups are being founded during recession and my answer and I think I mentioned that to you earlier before this chat is like yeah and and a ton of great startups were created during normal time or booming time and so like it's not the recession that makes the great company it's like the great company happens despite the recession at least in my opinion uh and so I I think as an entrepreneur you got plenty of hard times ahead uh building your company recruiting people managing your customers independently or, or independently of whether or not there is a recession and so I would not I I I understand the the desire to be optimistic but frankly I would feel better if there was no recession and I think we would be seeing a ton of really great companies and a lot of unicorns and we will all be better for that so uh in terms of uh talent and and how people can take advantage uh of the downturn to build a brighter future um i think that um there is an opportunity uh to um look at businesses that are being um more resilient 
because they have more money or they have a business model that is particularly uh, that is particularly well suited for recession and try to get in these businesses and try to learn from there. I think like learning how to uh, go through a recession is a skill that will be useful for life because then it means that really nothing, nothing really is ever going to trouble you because you've seen the worst. You'll be fine during the, during the good, during the good time. So I would, I would be even more vigilant about the type of businesses that I would, I would work for. Uh, and it's not just because, Hey, uh, maybe they go bankrupt and, and I'll lose my job, but, but it's also because I believe this is a unique opportunity to learn from resilient founders and resilient businesses, new, new skills. So I would, I would look primarily at that. And just to be clear, recession or not, as of today in the tech industry, there is more jobs than there is talent. So we are not, uh, we are not in a recession from a job search perspective for the tech industry. Yes. Yes. So, um, if you are someone looking for jobs in the tech industries, uh, I recommend you to go to the job boards of tech stars companies and look for, um, open positions for all these yeah. great, um, tech stars companies. Um, well, the other big issue facing startups is funding. As the CEO of the largest tech accelerator in the world, um, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on startups seeking investment in this climate right now? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there is plenty of money. It's not being allocated or distributed or deployed as much as as aggressively and rapidly as it used to be, but the money is still there and they're still going to need to deploy it. Um, I think that putting real effort into finding a partner or an investor who is really going to help you, uh, not just with some dollars, uh, but also with operational expertise, but also with mentorship, but also who can help attract other investors uh, in your near, in your next round is very, very important. So I would look a lot at uh, who are these investors that you want to have on your cap table because they're going to be attracting the others. They're going to help you attract the others. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think that was that important uh, even a year ago uh, because there was always going to be someone like, no, it's kind of important. Uh, so that's that's a, that's a important to know. And I think the other point I, I'd make is uh, we're, we're going back and it's going to make me sound really old, but we're going back to what fundraising used to be when I was fundraising, which is fundraising takes nine to 12 months. And you have to go and talk to 50 people to get one yes. And they are going to pressure you around your path to profitability and your customer lifetime value. And that's kind of normal because they should want you to be profitable at one point. Uh, and they're going to want to understand like, how do you grow in a scalable way? And so, it sometimes, again, I feel like I'm really, really dating myself, but like what has happened over the last two years is not the norm. And, and maybe, maybe if you're a young founder, you, you, you think it's the norm. It's not. <laughs> the norm is long, de uh, decently detailed due diligence with a decently large number of people out of which maybe one or two will make a check. And so I would just recommend focus on your business, make sure that it's a healthy, viable business that has a great target addressable market. You have a great product. You understand how you're going to monetize it. You have a team that supports your vision that has the right credentials and the right experience. You understand how to get your business to profitability. And, and we teach a lot of that at Techstars. Like we spend most of our time during the accelerator focusing on on helping you build a great business rather than teaching you how to fundraise because we've always believed that if you build a great business investors are going to want to fund you the the, the issue is that you if all you know is to go and fundraise when it's a great market then that's that's amazing you have an advantage but if it's a down market um your 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 great pitching skills are not going to save you from the questions around, Hey, is your business even viable? And so I would focus a lot on that. 
yeah, perhaps being able to raise your C round at 50 million cap pre-revenue, pre-product is not really the norm. So speaking yeah. of valuation, so, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so since every valuation has been way down um, compared to a few years ago, um, how do you think founders should adjust their expectations? So, so if, for example, if you, if for the founders who are actually lucky enough to be able to raise at a whopping valuation at, for the seed round, do you recommend them to just accept the fact that they need to do a down round for their Series A or, or bridge round in order to survive? Yeah, so um, we had a conversation about that, a public conversation about that with Brad Feld a, a couple of months ago. Uh, so Brad Feld is the, the founder of a VC firm called Foundry, and he's also a board member of Techstars and one of the co-founders uh, of Techstars. Um, and um, we were having this conversation about the stigma around down round and how like, oh my God, if you're a founder, like you have to avoid at any cost down round. And, and we've seen over the years, like incre in increasingly complex um, funding mechanism for round to look like they're an up round when they actually are down round. And so there's a lot of protection in the shareholder agreement. And, and both Brad and I, we have the exact same view, which is, down rounds are not necessarily a bad thing. If you look at the public market, companies uh, raise money at lots of different valuations, sometimes at lower valuation than previous valuation. And down rounds are not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you do in a very clean way, uh, which is like you, you make sure that you have no special conditions into it. And, and Brad says something that I found both very funny and at the same time very true it was like people keep saying once you have a down round you're dead and brad was like you're not dead people just give you money you're the opposite of that and i think this this to me was just a light way of saying uh to to entrepreneurs you know it's okay it's okay to do a down round if if your company is objectively objectively valued less right now because you're not selling as much or you're not growing as fast and I would just recommend that you embrace it. Uh, find someone on your board who can really help you with that. Uh, hopefully you have someone. If you're a textures company, you want to have this discussion with us, come and we'll, we'll, we'll help you think through that. There are a ton of companies, I can't give their name, but there are tons of company I know who've gone through a down round and come to the other side in much, much better uh, shape and are happy and healthy right now. Yeah. yeah. Mel, so thank you so much for all these wonderful insights. So since we have about five more minutes left, um, let's look into some of the questions that our attendees have shared in the chat box. So um, let's just get right down to this. So Ajit asked a question regarding freelancers. And so I'm just curious about given the volatility um, and the downturn that we have right now, do you see entrepreneurs or startups relying more on freelancers because perhaps of the flexibility um, that um, that hiring contract workers versus permanent? Uh, or do you have any insight or any recommendations about this? About what specifically about freelancers? Uh, yes. Um. So I think as, as companies are trying to restructure their, their cost structure uh, and having less fixed cost and more variable cost because they're like, I don't know what's going to happen six months from now. I don't know what's going to happen 12 months from now. And so because of that, they're trying to have, uh, to have also their employee structure to be much more flexible. I think there is going to be more freelancers opportunity uh, and these are going to be great opportunity because these are uh, these are companies that would have in normal time hired uh, full time employees for long term jobs. And now they're like, oh, I need the extra flexibility. And so I would expect that there's actually going to be more opportunities uh, for freelancers. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is I, we, we also agree this we, we also have the same assessment. So 
Um, if you're a freelancer, if you're a freelancing developer looking for opportunities, come check out us out at arts.dev. We also connect great freelance developers to companies um, looking to hire as well. Um, and another person from the audience would like to ask you that, is there any correlation between the amount of VC funding a company has received and its ability to face a turmoil and survive the recession? Uh, your ability to face a turmoil and, and survive a recession depends on two things. How much money you have in the bank and what is your burn rate? <laughs> if you raise yes. $100 million, but you burn $50 million a month, you're in trouble. <laughs> if you raise $5 million, but you burn $10 a month, you're great. And so it's, it's, there's usually, or actually not even usually, this should be a correlation between the amount of fund that you raised and your ability to survive a recession. And fortunately, uh, over the last few years, the company that were raising the most were also, uh, were also the one who were burning the most. Uh, and there has been a bit of adjustment required on that recently. And so I would really, if you're thinking about the company that you want to join, uh, I would not just look at how much money they raise. I would look at how much they burn on a monthly basis and whether there is a, a, a viable path when you sum the two, uh, the two part of this equation. Right. So, yes, it is definitely po still possible for a company who have raised over $100 million to burn tens of millions of dollars per month. Uh, we've seen stories like this on TechCrunch and other. So burn, being able to manage uh, the, the, the cash flow and how to use those um, funding rates, that's also another issue to, to take into account. Great. Um, is there any other questions from the audience that have not? Um, if not, um, I think we're almost running out of time. So, yes. Mel, do you have any final words or recommendations or advice for for us? I think the the if you're a founder, believe in yourself and surround yourself in people that you believe in even more than yourself. I think being nobody succeeds alone and, and, and really having people around you uh, to be your sounding board and the people who are going to tell you the hard truths and, and who are going to be there to help you is important. Uh, if you are an engineer and you're looking for a job, uh, don't let all the talk of recession make you think that there is no opportunity. There absolutely is. There's still a ton of companies that are recruiting. Again, go and look at our job post. You'll see there's a ton. Uh, and I continue to believe that techs, that, that tech make uh, innovation, uh, no matter what happened, recession or innovates, no matter what happened, recession or not. And so uh, I think there's a lot of great companies that are going to come out uh, in the next few years. And, and I'm, I wish you all to be either the founder of one of them or an employee of one of them. Uh, and yeah, look at Techstars. We have a few of them. <laughs> Yes. All right. So thank you so much for the wonderful recommendation and advice, Mel. Thank you so much for your time. And everybody in the audience, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I wish you guys have a wonderful rest of the day or evening. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.